And with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's kick off the program. For the first session, I would like to start with every industry, and you know it, every business has been impacted by the pandemic. And it seems like we are not yet safe from it, if you look at the recent figures. Transport and mobility have changed as well, leading to rapidly evolving business models and trends in fleet procurement, fleet utilization, and also employee mobility. We also know lower mileages, working from home, and new safety regulations that require new ways of procuring fleet and new financial models. Now it is the time to speed up post-COVID fleet management and to identify and seize the opportunities this new era in fleet and mobility can bring to us. So I would like to invite on stage with me Wim Galbuzera. He is HR director at BDO. Wim, welcome to Brussels. Jack Knoll. Jack Knoll is head of global car fleet at Cap Gemini. Jack, welcome. And Eve Helvin, the CEO of OV Drive. Gentlemen, we are going to open the program together with you. <laughs> Take a seat. Here is a microphone. There are some glasses, some water. Okay. So, I don't know if you can read it, but on the screen, we have three percentages. It's related to post-COVID fleet management. Any one of you has a clue what this could represent? So one is probably... It's working. Yep. So one is probably the decrease of average mileage um, of the vehicles, right? Um, cost, cost savings due to recalculations? No. No. It will be quite difficult. Yeah. This is the share of people working from home, according to Eurostat, in the beginning of 2021, 37% in Helsinki, 26% in Brussels, and 23% in Amsterdam. And apparently, those are the regions where people are most working from home. So we also know, probably also in your organizations, that due to the pandemic, we are now used to work from home. Jack, how, is, how has this impacted your fleet and employee mobility policy at Cap Gemini? Well, I think I can add an, a new percentage to it, and it was 95. In, in our business, the consulting business, uh, after mid of March last year, 95% of our people were working from home for at least a couple of months. And in June last year, we tried to go back to the offices as least partially to, with the capped capacity of 50%. Uh, and that has enormous impact on our business kilometers, of course. And, and, and that's what we see. Uh, but next, I think it, it will be an accelerator uh, in our transition to EV, mm -hmm. which is uh, our main goal. Uh, we want to be net zero in 2030, and uh, climate neutral, carbon neutral in 25. So that means that making those steps, and now with the lower mileage, you can even make EV and plug-in uh, more attractive in the rates. Uh, and that's what we see. But in our big fleet, Netherlands, I, see, I also see that people are just waiting out time, and uh, less and less people. If you have the cash allowance as an alternative, that people will uh, wait out and not order a new car for now and see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay. Did you um, adapt your uh, policy already due to the pandemic? No, no, that was not part of the pandemic. That was really part of our net zero ambitions. Okay. So, and that was about centralization of the fl car fleet because uh, before that, bef uh, no, uh, until last year, we had decentralized. So it depends a little bit sometimes on HR, sometimes procurement, uh, where it was located. And it's now a central function and therefore easier for us to deploy a global car policy. Uh, in our transition to EV. Okay, Wim, I would like to continue with you. Um, has the concept of the benefit company car changed due to the pandemic and the way that people are looking at that asset? Uh, not really. Um, in Belgium, the benefit car is still an important uh, package, a part of the comp and band package. So uh, people are still eager to receive a company car as it's part of a fiscally interesting uh, company uh, comp and band package. So 
uh, the, the COVID comp uh, hasn't changed that uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. If I see you nodding yes, but I can yeah. assume that there will be some trends coming out of this weird period that also will stay. What are the most important ones for you? How do you see fleet and mobility management evolve? Okay, first coming back to what Wim is saying, um, totally agree the concept of benefit car has not changed that much, right? It's still a really important part of the, uh, of the salary. And on top of that, what we see with most of our customers is that the works councils, you know, in different countries have done their utmost best to protect the benefits of the employees, right? Because typically, you know, what, what happens in, in a crisis situation is that the employee, employers use that particular crisis to make some dramatic changes, right? And the, the pushback that has come from works councils in order to defend the benefit car has been really strong, right? So it, it, will, take, it will take a while before we actually change the concept of the benefit car. What has changed, however, and I'm coming back to your question, is that work location has changed. Right, like uh, like Jack mentioned, working from home has become more or less a standard for X percentage of the total working time, um, which means that not everyone is has the same type of usage of a car, right? So we're not necessarily talking about less usage; it's different usage. We see that, for instance, people are doing more private mileage with their vehicles compared to what it used to be. So even if the total mileage of vehicles is decreasing, the amount of private miles is increasing. So to come back to your question, and now I'm finally gonna answer it, um, what we see is more solutions catering for that private type of usage. Mm -hmm. Like uh, for instance, uh, you give the example this morning, people wanting the car, but they also want the bike to go to, you know, do, do some grocery shopping and that kind of stuff, yeah. right? Well, that's exactly what we see as well, is that uh, bike leasing becomes more popular. Mm -hmm. people, people stay at home, work at home, so going to a grocery or something like that, they don't take a car, they take their bicycle, and so that's why people are more interested in getting bike leases from a mobility point of view than maybe... Uh, and it's healthy. And it's healthy, indeed. Yeah. So, uh, Jack, uh, it's also an opportunity, let's say, this weird period to perhaps integrate new mobility solutions for your employees, like shared mobility, bike, etc. Is that also how you, within Cap Gemini, look at the evolution of your fleet and mobility program? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's the bikes, but also uh, looking at public transportation. And uh, there's also looking strategically to your office locations. And, and uh, uh, if you're near a, p a public train station, it totally helps to uh, uh, allow people to also use it. Uh, and that's not the case in every country uh, yet. But we did see when we moved into it uh, next to the train station that it has an enormous impact on people traveling by train. Mm -hmm. uh, As an alternative next yeah. to the car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Eve, uh, Jack already mentioned it, that um, even his policy and the changes that perhaps are going to come are driven by sustainability. Okay. Um, and it seems that sustainability has now become even the most important as within the classical triple S configuration, savings, safety, and sustainability. What can be a little bit weird, uh, because if we think about the pandemic, then you could think that companies are more interested in cost efficiency and the safety for their employees. Or is that an illogic uh, reasoning what I'm having? No, it's a it's it's a it's a fair point, um, but it's not a black and white black or white situation, right? It's not because we focus on sustainability that that savings have gone completely off the table. If you look at the the global fleet survey, and you need to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in average, most of the international customers are looking at a savings of about six percent mm -hmm. year on year, right? So that that objective, that target, has actually not really changed. I think sustainability has come on top of it has actually surpassed the, the importance simply because most of the international companies have sustainability targets looking at 2030 for a net zero situation type of thing, right? 2030 means that we're two renewal cycles away, right? So if we have four-year contracts, it's about time to act now. Um, the pressure also within the supply chain is increasing on sustainability. So if you as a company, if you want to sell to other companies, you need to be sustainable.
because you're only going to buy from companies that are sustainable, mm-hmm. right? So there's, there's a whole context and people are starting to realize, enterprises are starting to realize how important sustainability is and the short amount of time that they only have. So I think it's more coincidence that we're talking, you know, COVID and sustainability a lot this year. It's simply, and I'm talking sustainability now, because the target is getting really close and the pressure is rising. Mm-hmm. At least that's my opinion. I just want to add something to that is that um, we all know we are in a war for talent at this moment. And so the fourth S is uh, uh, satisfaction of an employee or yes. the employee experience. And um, that's even more important at this moment. Um, people, uh, there is, a, is a not enough people to find in the, in the war for talent. And so uh, employee experience is very key at this moment. And that's now me speaking from an HR perspective, of course. Yeah. But that also means then that in the upcoming future, HR and uh, fleet and procurement will even need to work more closely together than they did before. I, we do already, so, so um, for example, uh, fleet is within the R- HR department at this moment, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Jack? Uh, to add to that, you need to also look at from a full service concept and an integrated product. There's no need, of, uh, you shouldn't do uh, only pr- uh, give uh, an EV without the infrastructure available or a charging card available. And, and I still see countries where leasing companies are only looking into the, the car and ignoring the rest. And then from a user experience, there is a no-go in the policy perspective because there's no way that we can offer a solution without something around it. And also the charging card solution in countries differs a lot. You should have access to all the charging points in the public area, of course. Mm-hmm. But, okay. but we need to work on that one as well. Okay. Um, do you already envision, for example, uh, shorter lease contracts uh, going into subscription models with more flexibility, etc., due to the fact that people are working in another environment, working at home, doing less mileage? Uh, I think flexibility in, in the contract should be key. Uh, uh, also, looking into the, the, the near future, where also uh, uh, batteries are uh, evolving somehow and, and having more range, uh, uh, other techniques uh, adding to it, and then locked into a four or five year contract doesn't me- make any sense if, if in three years time we have uh, cars with ranges to 800 kilometers, for instance. Uh, and then the flexibility to, to change uh, is extremely uh, useful. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. What is your opinion about uh, the industry going forward? We all, we all know that the, the typical lease contract, let's say, is four years. Uh, it's 25 to 30,000 kilometers a year. Uh, that will not be the case in the future anymore. Well, it will still be there. I don't think we need to write off the traditional leasing contract, right? Um, but I, I totally agree with, um, with what Jack was saying here, is that flexibility has become really important. People tend to not like to be locked down for a longer period, right? So we see kind of two trends. Those companies where savings are really important, they will still go for five-year contracts and they, you know, they accept the fact that they will be locked in. Then you have the, the companies that are really aiming for a high sustainability performance. They might go for a shorter contract. And the interesting thing is that we also see that the leasing industry is kind of starting to cater for shorter contracts as well. Residual values on three-year contracts are better than what they used to be. At least that's that's my my reading of it. But on top of that, have all these you know subscription models that are super interesting, uh, mobility solutions, public transport solutions. I think they can complement the car as a as a default solution really well, right? Mm-hmm. I was saying add-on mobility then to next to the company car and and offer the the choice to the, uh, to the end user itself and not pushing it from a company perspective and offering the different modalities and uh, it certainly helps. That, at least that's what I have seen for the last 10 years in the Netherlands. Uh, okay. Um, Wim, how far can you go with flexibility? Because uh, flexibility will probably also make it a little bit more complex to manage things. Yeah. That will be one of the uh, challenges is to manage all of this. Um, we see... Um, we. We want to see this as a mobility question and not as only as a leasing or fleet uh, question. And what I think is that um, 
the balance will be different. As we, if, if we talk about mobility today, big part is fleet. Big mm -hmm. part is leasing costs. Big part is all around car. And if we talk about mobility in the future, that, will, that balance will be different. And we will see a lot of more mobility choices within that mobility package than only a car. Maybe some of you won't like to hear this, but, but I think um, the car will be less important in, in the mobility package than it is today. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jack, um, out of the pandemic or with the pandemic, the industry is now also facing the ship shortage. Um, how do you deal with that within your organization? Because you are an audit and consultancy company, you need to order cars, those cars are perhaps not available. So how do you keep that in balance with employee satisfaction, with the sustainability targets that you have, etc.? Yeah, first of all, it's, it's a worldwide problem. So trying to be front in line, it, it, it's not helping. Uh, and, and therefore also not helping you in your situation. So it's a, it, explaining it to the to the people themselves of course and yeah, look into the world and you see that uh, what is happening and it's not not only impacting the, the car so we see it uh, in our uh, uh, ordering for monitors or uh, even phones or you see it everywhere uh, so it's a well-known problem and it's about extending the current contract to see what is possible and with the mileage of the last one and a half year it's, it's totally possible but keep on explaining uh, and try to find flexible solutions in, in, in the short term, also a midterm lease or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. and see uh, what is possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. What would be your tip to those corporate fleet managers here in the room? Is there a tip to give? Well, I, th I think Jack mentioned very well, so I extend your contracts because we have the possibility, but there's one thing that you mentioned, Jack, that I really like is that, you know, communicate to your employees, right? Because they have an expectation to choose a new car, if someone, you know, if, if the, the, the late delivery is going um, gonna to be an, an obstacle for someone, it's going to be for the employees. So the better you explain them yep. the situation, the more they will be accepting of, um, uh, of potential delays. Um, well, we've done a, um, a simulation for one of our customers where we're basically extending as much as we can. We're implementing short term as much as we can. But what we're also planning at the same time is a, a pretty big patch order of about 30% of the total fleet mid next year, right? And we are already starting to source for that, for that big batch order. So it's trying to switch from a problem to an opportunity mm -hmm. and then mid next year do the big batch order and go for extreme sustainable cars. But now we have the time to, you know, to prepare for that as well. Whereas otherwise you're in this, you know, this daily ordering process, and you don't have the time to actually look at it from a from an helicopter view. Yeah, okay, um, Wim, what are your policy and strategy tips coming from HR mm -hmm. to corporate fleet managers here in the room that need to deal with crisis situations and probably also anticipate yeah. future crisis situations? Well, a tip is. Uh, have, have a support from, from experts. Um, we don't pretend to be the experts in our field. Uh, we are from HR and so we do deal things with HR. So being supported by experts, um, it's an investment, but it will be a return on investments on the longer run um, directly because the experts will be better placed to negotiate con new contracts. Uh, but also indirectly because of employee experience, uh, employer branding, and that sort of kind of stuff. So th I think that's one tip. Another tip is look at it as a, at a holistic view of point. Don't only look at um, fleet, only fleet or mm -hmm. leasings, but look at it as a mobility question, as a, as a challenge. Yeah. Okay. Jack, do you have any tips for your colleagues here in the room? Um, yeah, uh, try to gather as much as information of your own, uh, uh, the global fleet as possible, and, and data is also key in that, and, and know where, uh, what, what the mileage is and what the impact of COVID is, and, and see what you can do with that data also in the prediction for the future. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. That, that's basically the, the big takeaway. You raise a good Get point. The, you talked about data. Uh, Eve, do you think that uh, this period can also be an accelerator when it comes to 
connected technology, data intelligence that you need from your fleet, from the mobility behavior of your employees? Yeah, the, in short, the answer is yes. Um, people have had in 2020 an experience that they don't want to see repeated, right? That they don't want to repeat. Um, if you're a fleet manager in 2020, part of your job is to extend the contract, do contract recalculations and so on. If you're a global fleet manager, you need to manage you know, vehicles all over the world, per definition. And it turns out that most of the companies have no clue about the current mileage of their vehicles in all the countries, right? So there you are, right? You need to realize savings, you need to recal recalculate your contracts, but you have no clue about the, the local situation, you know, have no clue about the, the mm -hmm. parameters of your local cars. So then they, they need to start digging you know, picking up the phone, calling colleagues on the other side of the world, asking for Excel sheets to be transferred, right? So that horrible experience is something that most fleet managers don't want to repeat. So that we do see an increase of interest in people looking for fleet management software, looking for, um, for ways to collect data, not via suppliers, but to collect data from the source, mm -hmm. right? And that's obviously where, you know, fleet management software, where connectivity solutions, uh, telematic solutions come in really handy, right? So I do see an increased interest in that because of the bad experience in 2020. Yeah. Right? Just want to add something to that. It is, it's not only uh, interesting to collect data from the source for saving purposes, but also from an employee experience. You can retrieve a lot of data being, and by that being much more proactive in your communication, proposing solutions to your employees. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jack, um, is it still interesting and exciting to be a global fleet manager in this period of time? <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, no question about that. It, it's very interesting, and especially to, to, to see the country differences. I must say, when I started this role beginning of this year, I was looking at it from my Dutch angle, and, uh, and then with the experience now uh, Belgium close by, but a lot of well, interesting discussions with workers' councils and, uh, um, and, and the other way of looking into mobility. And, and it, it's a lot of, it's messaging around and, and having the key messages also from a group perspective ready and, and try to explain. And it will not take one year to be there. Mm -hmm. It will take multiple years. And that's the time we have. So, mm. uh, What is on your to-do list for next year? Uh, it, it's building the team basically, having the operations now ready. This year was the focus on, on, the, uh, on the tender and the outcome of the tender and the, de uh, the local deployment of the contracts. Uh, and now it's the next step. Is, uh, well, we have the policies now and making a bond team and uh, looking for the solutions to, uh, to make it also from a user yes. experience more attractive. Okay. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you for answering the questions and for being here at the summit. And I wish you a great conference and the rest of the summit. Yves Helvin, Wim Galbizera, and Jack Knoll. Thank you.